All right. So do you want to give us an overview of what this API is about? Sure. Uh, so we've had a few requests for this, like actually quite a few, you know, over the over the months. Um, so it's sort of an interesting API. Right now, there's no way to construct a vector of t from a pointer location of any kind. Um, and so this is kind of problematic if you have your data stored somewhere like in a native buffer or if you're interopping with some library that has uh, the data that you want exposed in a native buffer. Um, so one thing that I think sh um, I should mention first, like why do, we need, why do we need this API? If this thing is a structure, why can't you just like take a pointer to it? Um, and dereference it, et cetera. Like none of the other structures in the BCL have like pointer constructors, so why do we need one for this one? I um, just wanted to mention like because this is a generic struct, C sharp doesn't let you like take a pointer to it. Um, so you can't like basically you couldn't take your, your data pointer and then cast it to like a vector of T pointer and then dereference that um, just based on those limitations. So we need like a specialized constructor that you can use to create vectors from a pointer. Um, so the Proposed API, it's basically just additional overloads um, on top of the ones we already have that take an array um, and an offset. So now you can just pass, instead of an array, you can pass a pointer and an offset. Um, and you can pass an int pointer uh, if you don't want to use unsafe code, or you can use a void star pointer, which is a little scary, um, but it kind of fits with the nature of the API already. Um, and it's the most flexible thing. So we've had a, quite a few requests for this. Um, so it's definitely something people want. Um, and there's sort of no really uh, workaround, like if you don't have this API. The only way to construct a vector is with an array right now. So you'd have to like copy all of your data into an array and then do that. I would say this is probably the most requested and probably the cheapest. Yeah. Because yeah. like on the JIT side, it's probably really similar to like the array overload. Right? It only requires changes in the um, intrinsic recognition, no downstream cogen changes or anything. So why do we need the offset parameters? Why not just like advance the pointer? And right, right. Um, that's that's an option. Um, I'm wondering if we have any other APIs in the BCL that we like. Do we not do this, or do we do that? Do this? Um, I sort of just chose this because it mirrors the array one where we have an offset, but it makes more sense for an array, obviously. Um, yeah, so I was going to ask, so for the array, the array, it's not really an offset, it's an index. That's true. So is this actually a byte offset? It would be a, no, it's an element offset. So okay. it would be an index, literally. Yeah, it would be like an index. Oh, this one is an element offset? It's such yeah, it's an, it's, yes, right. So we probably don't want to call it, I, mean, I would suggest not calling it an offset. Because I would read that as byte. Honestly, to me, that suggests getting rid of it altogether because it's prone to these kind of interpretation mistakes, right? Like, is it an byte okay offset with, or yeah. an element? Perhaps offset? for the int pointer one, we should leave it just because, uh, like, adding in, in pointers is a bit awkward. Why is it awkward? Well, it's just like less convenient than like adding, like, for, for example, if you have a float star pointer, you can just add like four to it. Mm -hmm. and you skip four elements, but if you have an int pointer, you have to like you have to do the multiplication. You have to like add the Size. You have to like add the size to your like uh, you know the number of elements you want to skip, and you have to like create a new int pointer and add it. Um, Do we need the NPDR overloads at all? I thought they were kind of nice, just like because it doesn't force you to go down to unsafe code. If it's, not. it's still unsafe. It doesn't force you to go to unsafe code. That to me is uh, negative. <laughs> 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 I mean that. I mean honestly, like that's the big problem, right? Because as I said, like if you actually use a pointer. Um, uh, then the nice thing is you kind of get the auto computation, right? You basically, if you have a float star or whatever, and you multiply it by four, right? Uh, it's like add by four, like you, it, it does the right thing. Versus if you have an NPDR, well, you kind of have to do it yourself. So in that sense, it's actually somewhat less safe because you kind of have to do the right thing. Plus, I mean, as Christoph said, just because the type is not actually a pointer type. You can still stack overflow if you do the wrong things, right? I mean, you, I'm not saying as though like buffer overflow, right? If you if you use the wrong pointer, you you, you exceed the thing, or you read like memory that you're not supposed to read. Sure, or, yeah. Yeah. What happens if I pass some weird offset? Now I land on the managed heap somewhere yeah. in the middle, and then I write to it. You're doomed, yeah, pretty much. 
Oh, and it's, it's, not, it's an unsafe API. And I would not have it, honestly. Which but one? Because, well, the, the one that takes in pointer, because the, the one that takes void star, at least you have to put it in unsafe block. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is how unsafe code works. This one is like, you don't have to have any unsafe block. You just pass some two random numbers and you write to this, and now you corrupted the heap without the code being unsafe. Okay. I see what you're saying. This is yeah. so, that at least applies to the copy to one. Um, the, the constructors are strictly like read only, they would just read the data. Um, but it probably doesn't apply to like copy to one. Oh, what do you mean? You cannot write to vector of t? Uh, you can, but it's a structure, so it's just a copy. But copy two will store the data back that's in the that's in the vector. Oh, so I see it, it, the constructor, the parameters when I pass uh, it copies. It basically takes the data and copies. Yeah. I see. I see. Okay. By the way, do we have a guideline that says like in PDR should not be used when the API actually writes to the pointer? We don't, but we, I mean, we should. Because, I mean, in PDR that just reads, I mean, it's still not safe, but you can do a lot less damage. I mean, do we follow that guideline in Marshall today? I think Marshall is weird because... Julie allocates her. Because Marshall has a bunch of APIs that are, like, super unsafe, right? I mean, like, you know, P, you know in PDR to structure, and, like, you, you, you get it, you write to it, and, like, everything's doomed. I think Marshall, like, I think the idea with Marshall was... Because it's interrupt services, you know everything there is unsafe. I think that's that's. I mean, if you use system numerics vectors, you know it doesn't imply that this may corrupt the heap. That structure to pointer does exactly what we just said. Yeah. So any like alignment issues requirements with this API? Um, so right now we just do unaligned loads, right? Um, we had discussed like these requirements when we initially were coming up with the SIMD library. Um, and like wasn't it Intel who said that or there's like some guidance that as of like the current processor, you know, lineup, it's not like a big performance hit if there if you do unaligned loads. So we just always do unaligned loads. So we do we do aligned loads where we know. And we only we only assume we know when it's on the stack. <clears throat> it, it's so on AMD pay an extra cycle, I think. Uh, but on Intel processors, it's basically the same. Oh, it's just unless it crosses a cache, a cache line, yeah. and then you know it's bad. Okay. So I'm I'm fine with leaving off the int pointer overloads. Um, is that sort of the consensus? The reason I included them like initially was I was thinking of some libraries like uh, system drawing. Like if you have a bitmap, you can you can basically lock the bits, and it gives you an int pointer back, and you can read and write to those pixels. Um, that gives you an int pointer. So technically, like if you were using this API, you could just use the int pointer overloads here for that without, you know, dropping down to unsafe mm -hmm. code, where the pixels that you're getting are from system drawing. It would be nice if we had the language feature that allows you to annotate seemingly safe APIs with unsafe. Enforce, despite the fact that you know the API doesn't use a, a pointer, you have to still use this API in an unsafe block. I mean, that would actually be. Can we not mark uh, API as unsafe? No, unsafe doesn't exist. And, uh, yeah. It's basically just allows you to use pointers in C sharp. Yeah. But I think we discussed this before because we had similar APIs or immutable that would allow you to get in the line array. We wanted to the same enforcement, but so far. There was not enough failure for the C sharp team to actually do that. One other question: Is there an implicit cast in C sharp from byte star to void star? Yeah, do I have to you can cast any pointer to void star. Like but do I have to cast? Or you don't have to cast it. So yeah. it's implicit. You can explicitly cast any pointer to another pointer. Okay. And any pointer is implicitly castable to void star. Okay. So basically, what this means is you could like. So this is vector of t, but if you have like an if if you have like a specific type of vector like vector of byte, you can yep. pass a byte star to it or a yep. float star to get a float. So honestly, I would start with just the void star. Yeah, it's it's those folks. They solve two problems: unsafe, it's unsafe, and second problem, you it, there's no ambiguity what the offset is. Yeah, yeah and and I would rename offset to index in that case. 
Well, but I wonder whether we should even have it. Like the moment well, we just have, just don't. because we just have a pointer, and you know, if you want to offset, you just say plus seven, and right. <laughs> then I'm good with that. Yeah. I'm okay with that as well. Yeah. That sounds fine to me. So we just have two APIs then. Yeah, one, we'll do one, yeah. We'll construct them and copy too. I think so. Yeah. yeah, it sounds great to me. I think so. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um. Do you want to talk to the alternative approaches, or do we believe that we don't? So. I was just going to ask this one. Yeah, so the the one thing about the, so the, the constructor takes a void star, and like all the pointers are implicitly castable to each other, so that means you could technically create a vector of byte by passing in like a float star, mm -hmm. um, and since it's implicit, implicitly castable, it would still work. Um, I mentioned I think that's okay, because you might just want to reinterpret your data, and like the pointers are implicitly castable, or explicitly castable anyways. So even if you took this approach, which would have like factory methods that took the strongly typed pointers, you could still just take a float star and cast it to a byte star and pass it to this anyways. Um, and it's a bit more like awkward, I think, using this. And we also need like 10 overloads for this. Yep. You can't do you can't do a, a T star? Um, I think like technically you, you can, can in IL, no. but like no, not no. in C sharp. Yeah. And do generic yeah. pointers. Yeah. Okay. So one other question yeah. I had is, um, I don't know. I know it's not in C sharp for sure. I'm not sure about IL. It is in IL because we do it in span. Basically, we have a, this type called span, which is very similar directly to vector. And um, half of it is written in IL for the for this reason. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you think it's a bit of failure, or because the the re reinterpreting is kind of a advanced scenario, right? You'd expect okay. most of the time people would want the. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can. It's, if you can't, if you can't actually create the API in the reference assembly, uh, or I guess you you could do it in IL, and C sharp would understand it. Well, uh, I don't think so. The, no. the the way we create span, we have a rewriter basically. What is your public API? Oh, I see. You see There's that? no T star in the public API though, right? Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, that's the. I see. Yeah. So then so we would have to have like the. You'd have to have the void yeah. star in the public API. So then that would. You couldn't well, we either avoid the bit of it. Yeah, I mean, we could have these like ten overloads where we add all like byte star, int star, float star, all of those. Isn't then, then it would be a closed yeah. set though? If somebody else had their own value type. It is. It's a closed set. You can't use your own value type with vector. Oh, okay. It already is. Yes. So it would only be ten, like ever, but it's still ten. So what's the t constraint to? Uh, t is constrained to like struct and like. It's one of. Six it's, or seven types, essentially, yeah. which we can't express in IO. It's oh. like the primitive types. Let's yeah, like we never did get I arithmetic, so it's just struct. So it's just struct, but then we... Not just struct, right? It's literally like in UN, like it's one of... No, but set of so the generic constraint itself. That's is what like you get, yeah. but the generic constraint itself can't say that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So I think that practice our constraint is if you instantiate it with any random struct, you will fail. And it will fail during construction, correct? Yeah. Yes. You have a runtime check, basically. Yeah, yeah it's a type load exception. But let's say the struct is just like two ints. You still fail. We still fail. Yeah. I see. Which is again related to span. We yeah. want to. We literally cannot avoid having this for span. So spans need to handle structs that are um, don't contain internally pointers or references to keep objects. So we need to have a constraint. For now, we are discussing like how to call it. It's called primitive now. It's just an attribute. We don't enforce it, but we are thinking about it. If we had such constraint in the language, actually, would you change vector of t? I don't well, think, I think that, that would. constraint is slightly different because ours like you can't use a custom value type with with vector of t. It has to be like a primitive type, which is basically just all the int types, all the un types, and then clone double. Yeah, I think in your world, you mean primitive in your world is not GC. You know, one of these ten types yeah. plus any struct that only contains one of those, yeah. or it's yeah. 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 And we would have the same thing except for the recursion. <laughs> and here it only makes up to the point where you actually do some operations on, on the data. So okay, I mean, if you could say t colon numeric, that would probably be pretty close to what we would like to have. When are we getting that numeric? I don't think ever. What is it? 
Well, I gave well, up. To be fair, I think nobody, <laughs> nobody like recently tried to formalize a proposal for the uh, language design meeting. So we tried again. No, no, I think nobody did. So I think. I mean, so yeah. we did. So I did. Oh, recently, yes. Yeah. Okay. So recently. Yes. Yeah, I think that. Yeah. I know. I, like I just don't understand. Like, well, I mean, we are free to write it up. So one other question that comes to I mind because I, I'm gonna just ask Carol. It's already written up. Probably she still has. So, I don't know if we want to digress, but but you have the time to do it. At You're the free. time we were talking about this, you know, I really felt strongly that it ought to we ought to be able to impose the constraint that you define the standard operators, but that requires that you have static interface constraints, static. Static interface yeah, method yeah, yeah. that aren't shared. Right. So um, doing that requires a change to the CLR, and that was a non-starter for the C sharp team. They didn't want to have. Apparently, generics was really, really bad, really, really painful, because it, they were. It, it was being exposed in both the CLR and C sharp at the same time, and the dependencies were. Um, so why don't we do it uh, kind of in two steps? Like first do it in CLR and IL, and then do it in C sharp later. So I, I tried that, and nobody thought it was worth doing because there wouldn't be anybody to use it, and there was no guarantee that the C sharp team would ever adopt it. Oh, so I, now that we're close again, maybe yeah. we do that. That's what I'm saying. I think I think we should write it up, and we should make sure like have enough of a landscape to say these are the features that would benefit from that. Yeah. And I think. Uh, I think span, I don't know what you could tie to that, but I mean, like the whole operator thing, by the way, to me is very similar to what we already know that we kind of need, which is like the whole extension everything kind of thing, right? Because if you can break apart a type today that pretty much only supports methods, everything besides methods, properties, operators, you're screwed. And that includes special, you know, static methods as well. So if we, I don't know how far we could go with one of the design points, but one of the ideas that I had, if you would have static extensions, you could potentially have static operators, right? That are living on different types, and now you could do it on any type so theoretically, right? So there's many ways you could go about doing some of the stuff, but I think it's just a matter of writing it up, justifying it. But as I said, it's probably already written up. Well, sure, but I mean, my, my point is, it's not just the the the, the writing the semantics. Um, it's also about making clear what the value add is and like which features would use yeah. that, and I yeah. think that needs a recent motivation. <laughs> Anyway, so one other question that I had is I think Jan brought this up last time. If we have an API that takes a pointer, there was this guidance to say if you consume more than one value, you need to pass in the length explicitly. Because otherwise you may be surprised that it reads six elements, right? And I think on vector we said, well, you know, the size is it's it's implicit, it's 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 known, I think it's a fixed size, but the, the actual size is, is hardware dependent. So should we add so should be force people to pass it in or not? So you, the size you always have to pass in like vector of, vector of load dot whatever. Right? Yes. So the so the, so the idea being like any API that basically reads or writes memory and takes a pointer, the idea was you always have to pass in the length, so you are never surprised by what it reads. Because otherwise, like if you actually you know do API reviews and you see a pointer passed in, you may not expect this thing to read you know a number of bytes or write a number of bytes. Uh, Personally, my care level is close to zero, but I mean, I think once you talk about unsafe code, it's probably a guideline worth thinking about. Yeah, it is. It is a, bit, a good point. But you're saying it's hardware dependent how much we read. Yeah, but it's very simple. It's like vector of your type dot length. So, I mean, it's not like it's a complete unknown. I mean, it's it always discovered. is, and that's how much it always reads. Exactly. Yeah. So, what about this? Is the vector. Um, uh, t that length a constant? Uh, it, depending on t, is. yes. Because it, we could add a parameter that is defaults to it. If it's a constant? No, it's not a constant in that sense. It's hardware dependent. But within a given hardware on a given processor, it's a fixed value. But you don't know statically which. Yeah, yeah, it's not a constant. Yes. yes. I missed out. So we cannot do a default parameter. Correct. Yeah, that's. I also think a default parameter would defeat the purpose because the idea is, for code reviews, you're forced to lead to read it in the code. I think that was the idea of forcing string length, for example, to take length and shit like that, and string copy and all of those. 
I mean, it's probably worth following up with Jan what, what, what he thinks on that, because I think he was the last person asking for that. I, so I can, again, imagine that like for a, for the constructor, we don't care that much, but for the copy tool, we do, because you write to it. You write to it, you kind of want to say, oh, don't write more than. Uh, I forgot, vector of T is writable, though, right? It is, yeah. So that means after you construct it, you write to it yourself. So I guess it's still. But it's, you write to a copy. Oh, sorry, the individual elements aren't, aren't writable. Yeah, you can't. Oh, that's right. You load, right, right. You're, you're loading it. Basically, the constructor copies, right? I see. Yeah. And you know, I, I think that's appropriate because it's fairly expensive. Would we want yep. to support? I don't think we'd want to support copying less than the number of elements in the vector, though. That would be misleading if we have like a, a, a you know, a parameter that is like length. Mm. It would so. Supporting there like are anything probably other. scenarios where that would be useful, and you know you would yeah. fill it with the appropriate zero for the type, presumably. The uh, that that would require a little extra work in the in the gen. Yeah. But I think there are scenarios where it would be convenient for people to be able to construct vectors from um, an array that doesn't happen to be a multiple. Right now, if you want to, you know, if you want to use vector of t, you almost are forced to ensure that when you allocate any of your arrays, you always allocate them an even multiple of uh, vector of t. And you know, it's not a huge hardship, but having the ability to specify a length and having it automatically zero extend might be useful. Do you think we should have an overload on the array, or that? Uh should we have like a length on the array overload? No. Possibly. We might want to think about it. Um, but how do you, you have like to make sure that the JIT could generate efficient code? So you wouldn't really want to have a loop where you're always checking to see if the length is the same, you know, until the last iteration. Yes. You wouldn't want to encourage that kind of that style of programming. So it, you know, it, it has some risk. Well, the other question is like, how much do you care about as far as the intrinsic goes? Would you prefer this being a different method, so you know upfront whether the length is supposed to be the same or not? Mm, that would help. So maybe we should because have like one with padding or whatever. One that that only <laughs> you could you could really be. Um, uh, hard news about it, and have one that only accepts a length from uh, one to um, length minus one. So you're forced to only use that for your cleanup. Otherwise, that it might throws be a little hard. Huh? Otherwise, it throws or something. Yes. Yeah. Is it very saying? I don't, I don't know. It's something to wonder. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, for me personally, it would require more um, thought. Make sure that we're not. Yeah, the petting one comes up time and again. So the only thing is that adding a check like this later would be a breaking change. Uh, what kind of check? What are you? Any check about you know like what we consider valid. Well, I think today the if we would have an order that takes length, you would enforce. You can only pass in exactly. What the length is, any value. So we would really. We would but that's kind of say if we wanted to, we could also do from you know one to like a subset. But if we would do that later, then it's basically relaxing it, right? Which would be compatible change. Oh, correct. You're widening so your you input. Initially, yeah. 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 Um, so I did want to mention one other thing about like CLS compliance. So White Star is not CLS compliant. And if we don't have an end pointer, I, I'm just wondering, like, should we provide like a byte star one? I don't even know if byte star is CLS compliant. You no, said you have to fix a star. I think is CLS compliant. Is end pointer yeah. CLS compliant? Well, yeah. in PDR is. Right? I don't know if we care, like. About Didn't you say like you have to provide an alternative <laughs> CLS compliant? Yeah, I. Isn't there are some other constructors of vector? Right. There are, so yeah. you're saying Within if I construct an array and I copy memory and then I load it, it's CLS compliant, yeah. but it's just yeah. less efficient. Yeah, it's probably fair. So you could do it. It's just shitty. <laughs> um, 
that's just sort of the thing I discussed right away. Oh, let's just take a look. Thing I'll remember now. Yeah, and I'll remember about what. Yeah, I should have known every time we copy. So in the case of this one, like stack alloc, we still copy the data. Basically, we first, we first allocate a sta uh, array on the stack, then we copy it to vector. What? So the important part is that like the JIT will sort of optimize these uh, like copies out. Uh, That's I see. The important part. Oh, I see. But for like so you're talking about the the ILO implementation. Yeah. So uh, we will not do two copies here. Right? I mean. That's correct. It will just load it. It, it. it generates the starting offset. I mean the starting address, and then it just does one load into the register. How do you detect that pattern in the JIT? You just know it's stack allocated. Because you saw the allocation to the variable earlier, like how do you? So, in in the JIT, if you are, um, <laughs> sort of go. <confident>. So, <laughs> <laughs> I would think. Moving on, it recognizes all the SIMD types, okay. and then the SIMD types are just these sort of generic uh, sixteen or thirty-two byte entities that are treated like primitive types. Mm -hmm. So they may exist on the stack, they may exist on the heap, they may exist anywhere, mm -hmm. but it's just this you know, opaque thing. And so then when you do um, an init, which is what these all get translated into, is this init operator. Once you get down to the code generator, it says, OK, the source of the init is um, an indirection of this address. Mm -hmm. And the address is, has been, you know, is represented in the IL. So uh, if the target is a SIMD type that was allocated into a register, it just does a load into that register. I if see. it happens to be that the target is a field of, um, uh, you know, something else, or if it's, you know, it's a static field, it's, you know, if it's in memory. Then it does a load into a vector register and then a store into whatever the target is. Yep. So from um, you know from sort of the importer on, these are just sort of handled like any other primitive type. Makes sense. They just sadly have really complicated passing and return. Issues <laughs> that are driving me crazy on Linux. <laughs> what other complications with passing and returning? So, on Linux, it has rather complicated um, mechanism for determining how structs get passed. So, because we don't, we're not using a vector API. These are passed in multiple registers, and then the, those registers have to get loaded and then merged into a single register or memory or whatever. It's kind of messy. <laughs> I would like to be able to use the vector calling convention for vector of t since it's not an interop type. For the others, we have to use exactly what you know will be used natively. All right. So two questions that I had was dot native doesn't do anything today with Sibby, correct? Sorry? .NET native doesn't do anything with Sibby right now, correct? They don't That's detect correct. our type. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. okay. I thought they were working on that like a long time ago. They, they never got I don't think uh we had a meeting at that. some point and in, I think I never chose it. Questions. Yep. And it seemed like he was working on it, so I just sort of assumed it didn't happen. I don't, I don't think it's in right now. So that means on .NET native, we use the IL uh, code, and then we hope that auto vectorization may do something smart, but that's probably up in the air with it actually happens. Um, so what happens on desktop? I mean, like it's the, the change is done in CoreCLR. I suppose it goes into full framework as well. But if we add those overloads, that means four seven, I suppose, right, or whatever the next version number is, right? So that means if they would release it today, we would get you know whatever the next release of course it is, you would get the awesome performance when you use the unsafe APIs. What happens on desktop now? Would they still work? Or would they would still work, but they would 
the, the new ones would be slower. Yeah. 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 You know, that's going to be, we're going to have to live with that, right? No, I, I'm just asking. I mean, if they blow up, they will be bad. If they're right, they're just... Uh, <laughs> Definitely don't. Yeah, 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 okay. That makes sense. Because otherwise, I mean, we wouldn't want that in any case, because otherwise, Eric and I would always have to work in total lockstep. That would yes. be very awkward. All right, so I think that's all the questions that I had, and then there was one that uh, Little Crystal brought up, which was... Uh, does it make sense to work to wait for span of T? But I think the answer is no because it is no. Uh, I would, yeah, we should in general be waiting for span of T. <laughs> yeah, that's true. All right, then I think I have all my questions answered. Anybody else? Any questions? Eric, Wes. Then I guess uh, we can talk about the next one, except that Palavi isn't here yet. Well, there's like 1040. So did we land on just uh, the two, so we mentioned like the two overloads, um, void star with no offset, and then yeah, just both void stars? Yeah, like, yeah, the copy two, yeah, and then the, the, um, both just take a void star, and uh, I will follow up with Jan to check whether he cares about okay. the, the length being passed in. And I think the padding one we should probably think about, but I would honestly decouple that, because uh, yeah. it seems like a separate feature. Yeah, it seems like potentially useful, but yeah. it's separate. Because one other thing with padding comes up, do we only support zeros or should we also support other things like, you know, I don't know, identity or whatever, right? Um, all right. Uh, by the way, like, what's the like timeline for that? We would, we would put it into RTM, I suppose, or uh, even RC, right? We're hoping, I think we're hoping to get RC2, but it depends on the, okay. how fast we can do it. So this mark is RC2, I think it is. Right? So quickly going back to the... Uh, I arithmetic. Carol, what's the cost just on our team? Forget about C sharp team. Like on our team to implement it in the CLR and uh, enable it in IL. Is it like super expensive or it's. You know, it's really hard for me to answer that because I, I actually did a prototype, but that was when I was new to the CLR team. And I didn't know anything about how the type system works. So Jan basically said I'd done a bunch of stuff wrong. But I got it working. Right? So if somebody who doesn't even know the CLR, I mean, I did know the metadata pretty well. So, But um, if I could do it, you know, it, it was maybe six months to do that and a really hacky version of uh, Vector T in the JIT. I, I just, I, you know, it's not a big cost. It's something Jan could probably do in a week, maybe more. I don't know. But like I say, it's, it's really hard for me to gauge based on six years old experience. But it's, you know, it's not... So if uh, now you know more about the system, what would be the cost if you did it? <laughs> yeah, but that is just the thing. I, I don't know. If I were doing it, it would take longer than Jan, pretty sure, because I don't mess around. With but them. somewhere between yeah. one week and six months, correct? Yes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I could get it working in a month, you know, and then, then you know, it would be rounds of reviews. And, oh. uh, we don't review IEL. And, 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 and I have to say, you know, the, the interface <laughs> dispatch is the ugliest code that I have ever encountered in a VM. It's probably worse, but... Oh, challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we had to fix this back because it was wrong. And it took me many rounds with invaluable help from Chris Anna to actually come up with a spec that described what we do. For interface dispatch? Yes. I don't know what I would have done without Chris because, you know, I'd say, okay, you know, after like walking through examples and staring at the code, I'd say, okay, this is it. Right? And then, um, Chris would say, oh, no, I've got this other example now that, that shows that this isn't how it works, and then I'd have to go back to the other part. Do we wait for Polavi, or should we just take the spring? She's, she's coming. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's probably totally wait. Worth like if she's here in a minute, then we should probably just wait. Do we have a list of them? I know we've added quite a few I think that's like back already, right? At least in the implementation. Wonderful. 
I notice we don't have the one that takes the frequency though. We only have like. How can you write games? <laughs> How can you write songs? How can you write space invaders? <laughs> you don't have beep with frequency. Beep is actually more useful than people think of it. It is. <laughs> really? Yeah, I didn't know that. In high throughput code, it's much easier to just say, does this code ever get reached? And sometimes it's easier to have a beep. Every time you should actually beep, beep after the build. <laughs> actually, you know, like I, like I'm missing this feature in our build system. When it finishes, it should beep. <laughs> That's not bad, actually. Actually, you have that feature. You didn't know that? No. If you go to the Windows control panel under sounds, you can register sounds. There is a sound even for breakpoint being hit in VS. There's a bunch of things you can register. How would you do it for your build finishing? Yeah. There's, a, there's an event. There's an event. For what? Build yeah. finished. There's even one for build I succeed from a console, like when we run. What do you mean? There's when I build core effects. Yes. Like from the command line. Oh, from command line. A oh, command line, I don't know. Yeah. But I mean, within VS, there's a plenty of events you can have. There's even one for build failed, build succeeded. So if you want, like, a, oh, for build failed, you can register that. In VS, I don't care because usually the process, the process you know, compilation times are short. Uh, I, I care when I build from command line and it takes, you know, 15 minutes. Yeah, you just all tab in. Don't know when it finishes. All right. Feature. I sent you an image. I'll send notes. The, the old uh, spec. Yes, spec please. That, uh, you know, whatever the proposals. We just need to before. lobby. Probably pretty out of date. We, we just need to lobby Raja now to give you a month. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. You want to walk us through it, Palami? Sure. Um, let me actually, uh, hold on, let me actually share the screen first, because that's, that may be helpful if people can actually see what I'm seeing. Here we go. Um, if you go down, there's actually analysis on what's left to be done. Uh, right there, I think it's coming. What so more left to be done than original proposal? Uh, so we did end up adding a couple of those APIs back. So the ones that are on the top, the title, be clear, key available, we added those since we've done a rough API review of them earlier. Okay. And do we have beep that takes frequency? No, we don't. So we just have beep, uh, which we provide some frequency with. The reason being we can't support it all. So this it talks about it, actually. So yeah. So we are left with buffer height, buffer width, largest window height, largest window width. These APIs kind of do not make sense on Linux because there's no concept of buffer there. But um, it does add value on Windows side. So we could support them by just saying that they will return the same as what the window height and window width would be. Okay. And let the scrolling function on Windows be at least workable. Cursor size would be something similar. So, let, so what, on Linux, basically, when you reach the end, it always wraps, correct? Correct. correct. Yeah. So buffer height is the window. Correct. Height. That's right. Yeah. Like, there's, there's no buffer yeah, per yeah. se there, so. But I, I think that's reasonable. Yeah, I agree. Because you write, you can write software that is truly portable. It does what you expect. Mm -hmm. um, Cursor size, not so much. I mean, like, it would be more of a new op on Linux, but it makes sense on Windows again. Why would we not throw? We have tried not to throw in most cases. Like, platform not supported exception doesn't really help here. A size 100 is like the default size of cursor there, so it kind of makes things at least... No, I think the getter is fine. The question is whether if you set it, let's say that you say if size is less than 500, succeeds, mm -hmm. well, set size to 300, still succeeds. I asked for the size again, still 100. Mm -hmm. That may be not what I expect it to be. Now, the question is, is that better than to throw? I don't know what people use cursor size for, but if you do it for, you know, computing offsets or whatever, like, your subsequent code may not actually succeed at all in weird ways. Is the getter reliable, or it's also sometimes no, we'll hardwired? Hard, hardwired to 100. Yeah, but uh, but users can change, correct? The cursor size yes. or something else. On Windows, and then yes. will still get hundred. On Linux, no, on Linux, it's uh, it's reliably one hundred. 
Is that what it is? My understanding is that. I thought we just picked a value. I don't know if we have any mechanism. So this API is completely useless on Linux. This yeah. whole property, correct? Both getter and setter. As far as I can. I would honestly just. I think we need to throw in these cases. Like we are. We, we should talk a bit more what we do in cases like this, and maybe that's the right forum. But like, you know, returning some fake values or doing a no for setters, I kind of don't like it, because it can just hide bugs and... Well, the, the, sorry, can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, so the getter in this case is a perfectly valid value. It's it's entirely accurate. It's just the setter that okay, isn't actually doing anything. I see. So basically, the cursor size on Linux is 100, and it cannot be changed. Right. That's that's a percentage. It's saying that the cursor size, for whatever reason, was designed to be a value between one and 100 that signifies the percentage of the vertical space that's filled by the cursor. And even oh. so, users cannot change it. Even like not using APIs, the user of the computer cannot change that, the cursor size. Is that correct? As far as I'm aware, there's no like at least in the shells that I've used, there's no way to do that. Okay. So, Steve, what do you think? Like, I I kind of tend, I don't feel strongly about this, but I don't have a very strong and well-formed opinion, but I feel like we should be just throwing that sort of exception instead of doing notes. But wouldn't it be similar to a background color discussion, right? Like, we didn't want to throw platform not support in most cases because now people have to test it across the board, and they get different behaviors, and like they don't like it. Well, but if somebody calls it, they call it for some reason. They want to do something, and then it, no, it doesn't do what they want either. Cause so yeah, for something like this, it might just be a visual thing, though. It might not be like necessarily functional. <laughs> like if it doesn't change the visible size, like not the end of the world for them. It's also not the end of the world to do a test, cache the value, and then just wrap these things in if, if you don't care about it being changed. So I, I would just say we should be consistent across the board with console APIs. If you choose to throw platform not supported, then you should do that like, with all I, APIs. I agree with that. I agree with it's that. very confusing story. If well, if we're going to throw it everywhere, we shouldn't have the API. Uh, yes, but we are agreeing that it makes sense in most scenarios, and hence we want to well, if, if you're throwing it on all platforms, then it doesn't make sense in any of the scenarios. No, not not on all test. platforms. On Windows, it works. Yeah. On Linux, on it, Linux, all it, Linux you know, it doesn't. I feel like in this case, we should just be honest with what's happening and just throw. I mean, the general the question is, I think I would be somewhat careful with statements like we should be super consistent because sometimes, I mean, the canonical example was the printer API. So, I mean, if you can enumerate the printers, Zero printers is a better answer, right? So like, if there is a if there is a sensible answer we can provide to degrade the experience of what's flowing, that may be okay. Like for example, cursor size to me, if it's always one hundred that it can never be changed, is a is a valid answer at that point. Like, no, no, the, the thing I that, that doesn't work the then is the setting, right? Uh, yeah, and I'm actually talking about the setting. The question is how would you I think honestly if you have a meaningful exception that explains why these things don't work, maybe okay. It may be tricky to write portable code this way because they have no other way to discover it. But I also don't think having query APIs for all these things is necessarily awesome too because now you have like is blah blah blah. Well, oh, if it's if it's that kind of uh, not statically no, but like you can basically do a test: Am I running on you know Linux? And then the documentation says that the setter will never work. Uh, you, you don't need query API. We already have query API. It's well, but the, but, the, yes. no, but, the, but my general the problem with that is that you make an assumption here which may not hold true, which is that all Linuxes are equal, which for some APIs may not be the case. Yeah, and if then also the feature set may change over time. So I mean the browser basically space clearly outlines what happens when you have you know platform checks versus feature okay. sets. But if we discover that now there is more variation than just iOS, then we add query API. I wouldn't prematurely add query APIs. In this case, I don't think it is required. Since we don't know of an instance of an OS that is Unix and supports it, for some APIs it's fully true. Um, you can always build your own too. Static, call it once, try and set it, catch an exception, yeah. set your property, yeah. and then a bit. 
if, it, if people need to do that enough, then they ask for a query API, we put it in. Yeah. And also, like, this is such a corner case API setting the cursor size. I would just not overthink it, and I think the exception is safer. It just, like, tells you what's going on, and you move on. You solve the problem if you're trying to write portable code. Uh, I kind of can imagine, let's say there's an API that you call, like, very often, and now you have to wrap them in all these statements. Then maybe we would have, have more. have a good telemetry data also around it, right? Like, oh. not for these APIs, per se. Like, we are basing it on our gut calls. But do you... <laughs> So, like, I'd be reluctant to add an exception if we thought it was a landmine, like a hidden, a hidden API call, something that you might not run until you go down one particular, like, data-dependent path of the application. But these types of things are, are not that. They're not like, okay, you have some type of input and it causes the whole application going. Like, if people are interacting with these APIs, this is their user interface. This is how they're setting it up. So, so it's not... It's not like a landmine. It's more like it'd be in their face. I basically, to me, it's like this is hiding a bug. Literally, by uh, somebody's trying to set it and th this being a knob, it's hiding a bug. And I kind of, I would say by default, unless we have very strong reason, I would not hide bugs. Yeah. Um, I think then we have a couple of others that we've already. So as a, a data point, by the way, like we, we do have the data for NuGet and we do have the data for API port and we do have some desktop apps, right? I mean. Probably the desktop app sample is pretty misleading because it's mostly desktop apps, which doesn't include console apps, so they don't use these kind of things. But API port and NuGet both have a decent amount of like things for a console, and the total usage is 0.03 percent. So, of uh, the setter, can you cursor tell size. between getter uh, and setter? Uh, for for the cursor size combined, the getter is uh, less than 0.02. Um, and then the setter is around 0.02. So, I mean, it is a, I mean, I would say you're right from the gut call, you know, argument, but I would say that things like cursor size, I think our gut feel is probably close to being accurate. Um, for some other things, it's a bit misleading, but like, you know, caps lock, same thing, I mean, it doesn't even show up in the data. It's like, uh, I'd actually 0.3% on desktop maps. But, um, you know. <coughs> I mean, the, the other argument we could make is like snowing in V1 may be better than no opening in V1 because we can always relax the check. We can never add more, really. So maybe we should go with the more conservative approach. Steve, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, in the I mean, past... Oh, oh, wow, I can oh, hear myself really loudly. I'm going to talk without listening to myself. Um, we, uh, in the past, we basically sort of made a judgment call between throwing and no-opping, where mm -hmm. we've thrown if it's largely observable, and we've no-opt if it's mostly not. So, for example, like, on the process class, there's this... Uh, function or a property you can set to try and like temporarily boost the priority based on whatever that means in the OS, right? We've made that a no-op because who cares? Um, it, there's, you know, yeah. we, could, we could say it was actually boosting it for, you know, no time and whatever. But in other cases where it's more observable, you know, someone could actually take a dependency on behavior somehow, we've chosen to throw to make it clear. Um, and, you know, we've had some disagreements in the past about places where we've been throwing and folks have wanted us not to. Um, in this case, I don't particularly care. I've never used cursor size. I've never known anyone who has. And I don't really know why you would use it. The only thing I could imagine would be, like, maybe put it into underline mode or something, set it to 1 or 100 based on whether you want underline or a full block cursor. I, I can't think of anything else you would do with it. Um, so if we want to throw, I, I'd be surprised if anyone hit it. Um, I'd be fine with that. Steve, yeah, I actually like the uh, kind of guidance that Steve just talked about, which is, like, if it's a performance optimization, like, you literally cannot tell maybe it happened, maybe it didn't. Right? Or it's something, you know, unobservable. Yeah, the knob, I think, is fine. Here it's like, I wrote my code. I said it. I wanted to write a, you know, subscript or something like this, and it's not happening. 
and I have no idea why. And I keep searching for hours and hours, and then I discover that you know it's not supported on my OS. Versus you get an exception, it says not supported on the OS. Stephen, do you know if uh, there's a way to set it to like underline mode, like you mentioned in, on Linux? Like, do Linux there is, support that? There is like an underline thing. I've never figured out exactly what it does, and I think it varies based on the shell that you're using, uh, or rather the terminal that you're using. Um, we could experiment to see what it is, and you know, if we wanted to, we could say that greater than 50 was full block and lower than 50 was underline. Yeah, um, well, maybe if we think like those are the only two, like if you really only think people are going to use it for like you know a full cursor or an I, underline. I, I cursor, was totally maybe. making that up. I was I was making that up off the top of my head. <laughs> So the best API design. Oh, I mean, to to um, to Emo's point though, like if we were to throw, it's always the kind of thing we could relax in the future by adding a heuristic like that to go back and forth between block and underline. If we know up now, uh, I'm not sure it's something we'd want to uh, switch to. Agreed. All right, so that means we should probably throw from. Um, so any other interesting aspects? I mean, I'm just um, looking at the text. Particular ones. One thing that I noticed is um, in the redirected mode, we behave very different in Unix and like in Linux and on Windows. So the reason is Windows doesn't try to explicitly say, oh, if I'm in the redirected mode, I need to throw you know, this kind of an exception. It kind of relies on the OS to do the things for it. So at times it throws IO exception, at times it throws, depending upon what handle you've passed to it. Now, if we were to emulate the same kind of exception on Linux or Unix, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense because IO exception in case of redirection doesn't make sense per se. So we will end up having different exceptions in redirection in redirected modes across these APIs. And by exception, you mean like you, you redirect and then you try to set yeah. the cursor Any location, those, for example, yeah. and that wouldn't work. Yeah. Why why this exception wouldn't work? In that sense? So, uh, the, so first of all, there is no guarantee that you'll end up getting I/O exception. You could get like the MSDN documentation also says you could get I/O exception or you could get platform not supported, or you could get any exception there. You're saying even for uh, our Windows <laughs> So I cannot uh, emulate that very okay, same behavior. I understand. I understand. Similarly, like on some of the uh, APIs on Windows, we say, oh, you know, I will try to use the output handle to get the value. If the output is redirected, I'll try to use the input handle or the error handle to do it, which is not the case in Linux. It's mostly like we'll since we are setting the streams, like we are writing to the stream, we use input and output handles. So there's no reason for us to check, oh, is error redirected or not. I mean, it just, to kind of bring those behavior together doesn't make sense here. So there will always be code we'll be writing which will not be portable in redirected mode. But if we look through the guidance on MSD and it says use these APIs only after checking that you are not redirected. If somebody is using it correctly, it should be fine. It's the people who wouldn't be using it correctly. We do expose uh, the redirect like is redirected Correct. APIs, Redirect. right? So, so what happens with color? Because I mean, I know on Windows, you know, color is not represented as with escapes, right? So that means it's basically a function of the window and a function of the output. Versus on, on Unix, it's part of the text, right? So what happens when you set color and then you write? Like, do we throw? Do we ignore? Like, what happens in Windows? Do you know? We don't write it out. So on Windows, it basically just means color is ignored as soon as you're redirected. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. On Unix, if you try and write, if you try and write any of the ANSI escape sequences and the console output is redirected, we just throw it away. I see. But from Linux, I just double check what happens on Windows. Interesting. Do we think that's the right behavior in all cases? Like, what happens, for example, if you uh, if you pipe the output of a, a command to, uh, let's say, less? Does it then basically lose the color for pagination? Yeah, but uh, you wouldn't get the you wouldn't get the color in less anyway. 
No, on Unix normally you do get right, right? Because if I if I like oh, like uh, I forgot what it is, but oh yeah, git lock for example. When you when you, when you run git lock, it by default pipes to less and it preserves the color. You have to play with it. Yeah, I think that. I mean, I think I don't know what the heuristic is. I could imagine something on Unix by default saying, if we know it's a file handle, we throw it away. If it's not a file handle, we don't or something. I don't know. Um, well, that's what we do. We we. Uh, I I was a bit simplistic in what I was saying, but we check whether the the handle, the 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 uh, the file descriptor rather is basically, you know, uh, the, the same one that's used for a terminal. Um, nice. If it's a, a charred device. Interesting. If we don't do that, then uh, you know, if we just say, well, we're always going to write it out, then you start writing it out to log files and whatnot, and you get a lot of gibberish. I mean, some of these ANSI escape sequences can be pretty long, um, and now your log file that you pipe to is totally mucked up with uh, with this stuff. <laughs> yeah, I can see that not being fun. Um. Actually, that's that's actually the reason we initially added those those checks, because it was causing all the logs in Jenkins to look like gibberish. <laughs> uh, I see. Um. So one question I read, like, wasn't there something special about ArcList on 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 Unix? Is this solved? Is this still supported? ArcList doesn't even we don't even support it even in other places, like done in native and other things. It's a uh, it requires another type that we don't even have in the contracts, which is the R Gitterator thing. I see. Uh, so like I don't think we can add these to, to those two APIs, at least to take the ArcList with any sensible thing. They were only ever really needed, ever used by many C++ in the past, as far as I understood it. Yeah. Um, for the stream and the encoding APIs, I know we had concerns around exposing these, uh, mainly for like uh, for our principles per se. Um, do we have any such issues now? With exposing APIs that return streams? streams no. Stream yeah. actually never. Stream and encoding. We want, I wanted to avoid the the encoding and yeah. reader. And encoding, but stream is fine. Stream is fine. Uh, and the encoding ones as well. Yeah. So. But honestly, I think we, yeah, right. we, we should. It's ship has sailed. You're fine with exposing encodings and reader writers from console. Yeah. And especially that, like, with the encodings, I did some investigation. It's tricky. Like, not having encodings there um, would. It's not as simple as just, OK, the functionality doesn't exist because they need to be there internally in the implementation. It's, yeah, I, I'm fine with it now. Does it mean, like, I'm, maybe I'm not reading this correctly. So basically, we would expose those guys here, yeah. and we would not expose those guys here. Yeah. That's my understanding. All right. Is this an exhaustive list, by the way? Is there any more APIs on console? Well, I don't feel like okay. this. Like this one. Was there a stance on Arctis in general? We don't want to support it at all on .NET Core. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, it adds a layer of complexity that's not really useful. Like, params array is just clear replacement for most things in .NET world, so. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, actually, these are the ones we cut. <coughs> All the people did mention like caps lock and num number lock can be implemented using third party APIs, but I don't think we would want to depend upon them. You don't think we should have them because of why? So, uh, so there's no POSIX API on Linux as well as Stephen and I know that can implement caps lock and number lock. But people like on, on the thread did mention that there can be some third party APIs that we can depend upon that might give us the same like might help us implement this, but honestly, I'm not sure whether it's worth it. So honestly, there's no way to play a sound on. I think there is. Like, why don't we do the beat by just playing a sound? 
we do that. So we, we do implement the beat that doesn't take frequency and duration. Yeah. Why don't we implement this? Uh, the frequency and the duration one. I can take a look at it, but I, I believe there's no good way to. Seems like there's no easy way, although somebody commented about a third party library that would let us do it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, the question is how thick we want console to be, right? I mean, is it worth going, taking dependencies on more libraries just to implement APIs that like 0.03% or 0.003% of people are actually using? Yeah, no, no, we don't want to do I, I'm just surprised that there's no really available API to, to do this. It's not that I think we should just keep searching now for yeah. wacky libraries or some wacky solutions. So, like, how do they do efficient uh, terminal output? Stephen, do you know? Like, I mean, I it seems like, like, I mean, like, bu 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 you know, buffer area seems like something you would need to have to implement something like uh, less, for example, in an efficient way. They don't have that? Not as far as, far as I'm aware. Oh. I mean, there might, there be, might I, be. I've never I've looked, looked at the implementation, the implementation of, uh, of uh, whatever it's called, Encursor. Uh, curses. Yeah. Well, you know, Windows, even move buffer area is not as fast as I would like it to be, because I try to implement scrolling with it, and it's still painfully slow. But, um, but I mean, like, you know, almost all my terminal sessions, when I, when I, do output to less and scroll super fast. I don't know how they do it. Then. Uh, there very may, may well be support. I just don't know what it is. I, I can look into it a little yeah. bit more. But I guess the other signs are fine, right? Side, set buffer size we can support. Uh, set window position, obviously not. So what's our story for those moving forward then? Like, I mean, if I'm targeting both Windows and Linux, how would I get those APIs back then? Did we say we never support them on Encore? You pin both? Like, what's... You're probably going to have to be tied to the particular shell you're in, and you're going to have to call native APIs to do that kind of functionality. So that would be pin invoking, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Do we know how shitty those are, by the way? Like, how hard is that? Is it pretty straightforward, or is it, like, 30 lines of code to just set the size? Not one like it's it's going to be one pin work calls, but it's not that simple either. I mean, you could probably pin some, some other, other, other library that's already implemented all, all of it, like, like curses. curses. Yeah. Okay, it's The only thing about that window API is that concern me is since we are exposing buffer and we are exposing the other things, for you to write a console like with all the scrolling mechanism and everything, you would need these APIs also, at least on Windows side. So yeah. if you do not expose it, you're kind of giving them a half bit story on Windows. We could throw platform not supported exception at least make the Windows side of things completely available, but it's one of those situations that it's not an easy call to make. I will be fine with it. I think we talked in the past that, you know, like one of our objectives is to make it easy for people to port existing code. Mm -hmm. They may be, you know, porting from Windows to Windows. Uh, so, you know, it's an objective. The API, like if it was the first API that, you know, otherwise we have beautiful API that is you know, designed to be cross plot and now we are introducing as, you know, first word, I would be more concerned. But this seems to be like yet another word, which... At some point you no longer care. That yeah, at some point you, <laughs> you no longer care. So... Yeah, Stephen, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Because you pushed pretty hard on not exposing APIs that would always throw on Linux, right? Uh, certainly uh, so for the common ones. Uh, these are much less common. Um, I mean, everything, uh, like if you look at some popular, or not popular, but if you look at various sample code out there that uses console, these this last bucket, they're pretty rarely used. The things above this are pretty commonly used. Um, 
But uh, other than some toy apps that you know try and play music using Thread.Sleep and Beep, like um, you know, no one no one really uses that. Uh, other than extremely complicated console apps that try and optimize, you know, they're not using buff, move buffer area. As far as I'm aware, things like Mono don't implement these. At least you know, if they do, they're either throwing or no ups. Um, uh, I'd be hesitant to expose something like caps lock, number lock as a no-op that returned always false because then, you know, it'd be sort of lying. So if we were to expose that, we'd want to throw. Um, I don't know. I, I'm. Uh, it really depends on what our goals are, I guess. If our goal is, if our primary goal is to enable people to port their apps from full framework to core CLR, then we should expose them. If our primary goal is to allow people to write cross-platform apps, then we shouldn't. But I, I think we have both of these goals. I'm saying, you know, like, the API is already, like, if you're on Linux, you will have to be careful. So I don't think we it would make the lives of the Linux develop, developers much more difficult. Um, I was specifically talking about just the buffer and the window. API is caps lock, number lock, beep is totally OK, I believe, because for the first beep, we, they can at least use the, the initial one. And for caps lock and number lock, I don't think like, it's a scenario that they will really. But yeah, for the just, rest, it's like, it's like half a story that we are exposing. I mean, I just checked the usage. I mean, the usage is very low. Like, it's like 0.4% on, on yeah. uh, set buffer size, and that's yeah. the most commonly used. Everything else has a 0. 0.0 something. Uh, so, I mean, they are super rare. I mean, I'm just, I'm just wondering like, what our principle is. I think, in general, like, I would be in favor of saying, Unless it makes the API like it creates a super common pit of failure for cross-play developers, I would be in favor of keeping APIs that we know we can only support on one platform and just throw, rather than crippling the contract for everybody. Because I mean, there are people that will not care about Linux at all. The question is, what's their story going to be on Windows? Now the question is, these APIs are so rare. Like practically speaking, we're not really harming Windows adoption because it's not very commonly used. So I'm fine either way. I mean, I could, my stance here though is like if one of our big premier partners, they're that one percent that use these APIs. How much work is it for them to actually implement these? Um, yes. I think it would be quite a lot for some of these to kind of get right. So I, that would be lean me more to a favor, just exposing them and just throwing on cross But to um, me, and to me, as I said, to me, it's uh, to some extent there's like a big jump from beautiful API that has no words. To an API that is not beautiful for cross plot. After that, it's like I just keep adding APIs and just create a nice. Do we have influence over documentation for these APIs? Because it would be nice to add. Uh, we haven't really gone like a guide for Linux developers that says, "Hey, if you're using console APIs, here's how you check. You know what's supported, what's not. Here's how you." Which APIs have problems? So the short answer is in the doc story we are working on it, specifically for .NET Core, and uh, there are there are plenty of thoughts on how to how to talk about this in the context. Or of even blog post, like Palavi, mm -hmm. could you write a blog post for like Linux developers using console APIs? It wouldn't be much, but yeah. What? <laughs> it just works. All right, no, because who wants to use the console API? I also think that the, by adding them, we open the doors for some Linux systems and some shells to be able to implement them and use them still, too, even in those contexts. And because of the open source, we can people can just provide their own. So. Exactly. So, I mean, OK, so that means so should we basically uh, decide to take those APIs in, then? Is that what I heard? That's right. I'm, I'm hearing. We didn't. I didn't hear an answer for caps lock. And I'm like, we're we gonna basically throw on Linux on those guys. Uh, um, false. I was thinking of not exposing them, but I'm fine either way. I mean, this is like they all like. I think caps lock and number lock are super low usage. I mean, I, I, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I'm fine. How, how would I get that information on Windows today if we don't expose caps lock? What's the What's the do I have to like listen to all of them, like subscribe to something and keep track? Yeah, of that's them? actually a good point. Like, if the, I, if I think there's just a single function you call yeah. to get the keys. 
Okay. That's, that's actually a good point. If like uh, you know, if uh, on Windows you could just like even be invoke, but it's you know a simple translation from I have a program running. I'm trying to port. I don't have an API. I search the guide. Maybe it's not just for Linux, but in general for porting console, and it basically just says be invoke to this one. I think that's a reasonable solution. All you need to know is the uh, virtual key code for the caps lock and number lock, and then just you call it be invoke. Okay. If there's uh, like an online <laughs> people call with a signature, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not both exposing this and throwing. So that so means you would expose everything but caps lock number lock. What about beep for frequency duration? You would throw on that one, I suppose. We would throw on all the method calls except on, okay. on cross plot. Yeah. Okay. That means we pretty much bring out the whole console contract. Except for those two and uh, the arduous ones and those yeah. two properties. Which, which again, like. One point we should consider is we are almost, you know, like we could almost have a great story for Windows developers. Basically, say the APIs are as is, yeah. except for those two where you have to be invoked. Maybe we just go all, go all the way. I mean, it's not, we are throwing on getters and other properties. Yes, we are. Yeah. So okay. I, mean, I don't want this, but on cross but like I, my my differentiator was like it feels weird for properties to be throwing them. But like if we're already doing it for others as well too, yeah. it's like. And then the porting guide would be simpler. For Windows, it would be it just works, and for Linux, here's how you deal with you know the not supported API. Yeah, I, I like that better personally. Like, the Arduous one I think requires actual things outside of the contract uh, uh, console control, so I'm okay with those not being there. But the, uh, everything. And also, Arduous nobody like you literally don't care because you have exactly like if you yeah. have a call you to this method, it's, it's gonna work. It's, it's gonna really just be less efficient, correct? Like source compile yeah. will just work. On it, so yeah. it won't even actually be a source compile break. So does that mean we know one X close capsule or number block, or does that mean we don't? I think uh, that's what we're learning. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So then let's take that one. So is it that? I just wrote it up what we said earlier. All right. So is this the story you want to follow across the board because we'll be soon having the function APIs also? Well, we'll see how. Uh, it's how it's I was going to ask you about that, but yeah, we, it's going to be. We're going to try to be as consistent as possible. Expose as much APIs as it makes sense. I also would say, like one thing that you know plays in my opinion on this one is that if there are APIs for that you would normally use in in a library, so we want to promote portable libraries and having like very wacky APIs from portability perspective in, for libraries, it's not great. These APIs, it's usually an app. When you port an app, you kind of you know have have ability to test it for all the scenarios that you care about. Library, you kind of have to ensure that it's going to work no matter how, in what context it's being used. So it's much harder if the APIs that you call are not portable. Yeah, we'd have a different conversation when we were talking about write line, console write line, for example. Yeah. We would probably not expose it as opposed to throwing just because if everyone had hit it. Kind and of that's thing. another thing, yeah. Yeah, I think, though, I mean, since you, I, mean, I think, is this everything for console? I think, yes. OK, I, so I then maybe we should use the remaining like time to actually talk about the principle we just talked about, which is the should we always port APIs that we can support everywhere? And I think there, there were a few interesting dimensions. One of them is how commonly is it hit? Like if everybody hits it and it's very easy to have a pit or failure, I think we should ear on the side of factoring it correctly and making clear it's on support everywhere. If the API is small, like you know, very rarely being used, but it's trivial to pinvoke, maybe, right? It's one of the two options. I mean, this goes back to your earlier argument. If the entire contract is portable except for one API, Maybe it's worthwhile removing that one and then making it work everywhere. Um, but for things like reflection, for example, if in order, like you, if you would, if you have something that is platform specific, and by removing it, you remove a whole chunk of API surface. In that case, that would also be in favor of factoring it correctly and moving it out because well, there's no point in. There's in one the, example of reflection. I think we're gonna go back and forth around, this, which is the, the binders. The binders is an interesting one. We would prefer not to have the API at all, like, but it. it it's it's a common parameter in a number of the APIs we would like to have. So it's like this one stupid thing that's always you always always pass an all for that parameter, but you have to have kind of the type in order. But this is an interesting one because couldn't we just add an overload that doesn't take a binder? I mean, yes, it's a new API, and it's it's not, won't be. You know, we're not worried about binder compatibility, you know, but like it won't still be source compatible either, unless we took something. But, but, that, that, but that to me is like the question because I mean, in order, like, let's say we would like to kill binder. In order to make those overloads work, what it would have to do is it would basically dummy out a type um, just so that an overload that everybody always passes is null to 
seems a bit on the excessive side. I would I would do what you were suggesting. Just add new overloads that just don't take a you know re reshuffle the parameters and move on. For in the future we have nice API. I and think we can try that, but I, th I have a feeling that some cases that's not going to work because there are already overloads that will conflict. Like for example, if you have code that passes null there, that'll resolve to another API now. You know you'll get conflicts. We have to look at the okay. Okay. If we run into conflicts and it's not a constructor, yeah. you can add a you know different name method. Yeah, but that kind of defeats some of the purpose too. No, because I always feel like we should just change the parameter to object and like just let it go by. Like it's being, they're passing no. Object do not use. <laughs> object obj reserve. We, we have no ability to express it in our contracts. It's this kind of change. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that to me is like a, one of those things. I mean, reflection is, as you said earlier, like full of warts already. Like I mean, I, I care. A bit less about reflection because it already has so many other problems that 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 the binary thing doesn't even register yet on my <laughs> high level things, like all the other things we talked about. The fact that binding flex you can use that, you know, most of our like flattening APIs are gone. Like this is actually the thing we definitely need to fix. Yeah, I know. But almost all the ones where you use binding flex, you have a binder. So I, like, I think we're I landed last time. I convinced myself we're just just having a binder type. Keep the type with nothing on it. It's kind of it's a dummy type, like we did the XML schema. For to be fair, though, it's actually not that common because I was I was recently doing some reflection again, and uh, it only happens when you want to specify the binding flags. But in some cases, in many cases, you actually don't have to because the API already does the right thing. Sure. Yes, but anytime you need to specify binding flags, which you know people want to do, you, the binder comes in. Yeah. Because I mean, quite frankly, if you pass in the argument types, and they match exactly. You definitely don't need a binder, right? And then the next thing is, well, you also don't really want to need binding flex because you literally specify the signature, right? I mean, like, there can only be one of them. So the fact that it's public, private, or whatever, like, you can uh, you can check after after you got the freaking object back. I mean, you specify the thing you want to get. That's why it's a bit of a fishy argument to begin with. with I need to pause in binding flex. Yeah. Um, all right. So that means. All right. Bobby, do you think you can have a, uh, uh, an API review for the uh, reflection next Tuesday? The meeting slide? Um, do we want it for the whole system reflection? Then no. If you want particular types. Well, I like of most of the system reflection, yes. And you're talking about adding all this stuff back? Is that the API review? Uh, yeah. I mean, what would be helpful is just presenting what you have so far. Sure. And then we can use the remaining slot to talk about what it is that we want to achieve. Because I think the the two things I think we said earlier, I'm not sure if that's still the case, was you basically want to expose everything we have, however you want to preserve the type split. So that means the APIs wouldn't go back on type, they would go back on type, type. info. Yeah, that, that part is easier. And that means, like, I don't know how far we can get. Like, I mean, the binder thing is one of those things, but, like, is there more of these APIs that we, we promise a certain behavior that we don't want to promise moving forward, like type get type, for example, had some of these issues, right? Um, I think you should have at least one on Tuesday, even if I'm not able to complete it. Will give me the idea. Of how yeah, if you're gonna if, if if you're gonna focus on one area, look at the type and type info part, and forget about the other ones for now. Yeah. Yeah, I think you should have at least one. Even yeah. Yeah, I mean, even if we can't expose everything, I think if we just get you know the the typical get methods, get method, get bind, uh, get get member, blah blah blah, with the binding flags, that will probably by itself solve like. 85% of the issues we're hitting. So, I mean, we, we have usage data for those too, right? We can figure out which ones are, they're hitting on type missing. Yeah. yeah. I think from a contract perspective, it might be easier to make the call. I do not have any idea of how the implementation is, like which part of it is in like runtime, which part is here. So, those boundaries. Yeah, from the implementation point, I don't think it's going to matter because we're already, except for on N, it's the only case, but I think we implement most of that stuff on N2 as, as wrappers. And I think so. So the other thing that comes to mind here is the um, we say we want to preserve the type split. Like, but what are we doing with old style PCLs? Aren't we basically saying there is no type split for old style PCLs? There's a well, it depends on what, what which which platform you're looking at. But yes. Well, let's say a target like I don't know profile like one of the old profiles. No, yeah, so if you have old style portable library, it doesn't have to split. That's correct. Yes, and we still preserve like we we can still run those in .NET Native, correct? Um, what do we most do? of them, not all of them. It's even even there's words there. Um, we can't. Be I see. 
but it can do, I suppose, type get member with finding flags. And we are fine with supporting that forever. I don't know if we will. Like for right now, I, I, I don't. We have we have some magic with an IO transformation phase that's done in native right now. When we start talking about CLI or RT native, um, that doesn't exist. I don't know how we're going to do if we if if we can even do it at all. I will be in favor of killing it. I've been trying to do that. You know, I I pushed pretty hard to get it out of that native, but then there was enough. <laughs> yeah, no, it's hard. Flashback to to add. Uh, yeah. All right, so that means I think I got everything out of the meeting. I think you got everything out of it. Uh, I took some notes. Um, the guidelines I will probably add to the porting guide that we just talked about. Um, and then that's pretty much it. Everybody's unblocked? Great. Thanks, folks, online. And sorry for not taking all the questions because I didn't see them earlier. <laughs>